Next, we have Laura McCann, who will be talking about factors affecting the price of manure applied on corn. So the motivation um, is, has been talked about a lot, that if we can get um, manure to be transferred from people who have it in excess to people who need the nutrients, that's generally a good thing for the environment. Um, there's very little information on manure sales, like concrete information. I mean, we, this is a, a good um, complement to the previous um, presentation in that you know we can model some of these things, but this is um, going to talk about what um, actually has happened based on surveys and so on. Um, and I did a little, pre this is a, a plug for a long ago um, conference that I organized at Missouri, and which I thought had a very clever name, uh, Manure Entrepreneurs Turning Brown to Green. So we had a whole bunch of people who had basically made their manure into profit centers. And um, it was pretty interesting. Um, I had a graduate student um, who uh, did a survey with me um, in 2004 of Iowa and Missouri farmers. Um, we found that 19% of the crop-only farmers use manure, and 36% of those paid for it, so just over a third in that survey. Um, and they, they tended to be, you know, not large-scale farmers. They were um, younger, less educated, little off uh, farm income, smaller farms. Um, some of the, um, so these, these are all significant results. Um, and there were uh, barriers included the transportation costs, difficulty in estimating um, application rates, and smell. So we had a question in there that basically said, the smell of manure bothers me or my family. You know, how much, you know, yes or no. Um, and that was actually a significant predictor of whether they used manure or not. Um, and it was generally applied by the, the supplier, the livestock farmer, or a custom applicant. Um, another study with uh, a graduate student and an undergraduate student um, was published last year, and it looked at, so it was surveying livestock farmers, and um, looked at testing of manure that was transferred off the farm. And, you know, this, you know, if you test the manure, you're probably thinking of the nutrients having some value. Um, so this was in 2006, it was the same survey that the poster um, was based on 51% tested manure, okay, but for people who transferred it off the farm. For the general group of livestock farmers, uh, only 20% tested it. 57% uh, were paid for it, um, which is good, the majority. Um, and there were species differences as to um, whether they were paid and the distance it was transported. So some of that showed up in the poster but some of the material from the poster is um, in one of the tables in this um, article, if you want, actually want to go and look at that. Um, so poultry is transported very far distances, and they're almost always paid for it. Like 80, 90 percent of the poultry and turkey farmers were paid for the manure. Um, a smaller percentage of the swine farmers were paid, and it was, you know, transported an average of, you know, two to three miles. Um, it was less likely to be tested if it was solid um, versus liquid, and if the animal units per acre was higher. So high animal units per acre indicates you would probably have excess manure. Um, so it was less likely to be tested because you had excess nutrients. Um, it was more likely to be tested if farmers thought the practice was profitable, if it was transported further, so if you're paying a high transportation cost, you want to make sure that you're getting what you think you're paying for. Um, if there was a contract for the manure, and if payment was received. So all of these variables kind of indicate that manure testing goes up if people think the value of manure is high, if they're, if they're really buying it for the, the nutrients. Um, so we've got a quote in there, the value of manure nutrients rather than the water quality impacts is what's driving manure testing. Um, another um, study that 
they did sort of a, a survey of potential manure buyers. Um, so it was hypothetical. And they looked at um, swine versus dairy manure, and people were willing to pay more for dairy manure um, than swine manure. OK, so I'm, this study, which is preliminary, is continuing these other studies that I've, uh, I've discussed. Um, and we got funding for this starting in last October. And so this conference came up, and I got all excited. Um, so it's very preliminary, and I'm hoping to do more work on it in the summer. Um, so trying to characterize manure markets um, and looking at factors affecting the price of manure paid by corn farmers nationally. So I've, the surveys I've done with primary data collection have just been in Missouri and Iowa. This is a national uh, secondary data set. Um, so looking, are there regional differences? Um, trying to see on a larger scale whether these species differences hold. Um, distance, solid versus liquid, who's applying it, size of farm, whether that has an impact. Um, so it's the ARMS um, data set of corn farmers were interviewed in 2010. Um, the dependent variable was the total price paid for manure applied on a specific field and included transportation costs, but not application costs. So there's no, this is a problem with using secondary data, is I would like to have the value of the manure itself separated from the actual transportation costs, but it's combined in this data. Um, and it's just uh, OLS regression analysis. So one of the things that you can see, the full data set, so all the corn farmers in the data set, and then the people who use manure. So um, acres of corn is larger. The size of field, that's the basis for the questionnaire, is uh, larger for uh, full data set. Percent of revenue from corn is higher. So you can kind of think these might be livestock farmers, and it turns out that's kind of the case. Uh, percent certified organic. Seems to be very little effect of um, you know, being an organic corn producer making you more likely to use uh, manure because it's such a small number. Um, so the majority of people were using their own manure. Um, the distances are similar to the ones that were in the poster, about 3.29 miles on average with a range from 0 to 320 miles. I'm going to have to go and look at that 320 mile one. Um, and this excludes compost. So compost was a separate set of questions. I'm just looking at sort of fresh manure. Um, and 16% indicated that some sort of regulation had affected application rates. Um, custom applicators were used in 17% of, of cases. Um, so the manure was tested in 22% of cases, which is similar to the data that we've had from our own surveys in uh, Missouri and Iowa. Um, the most common source of manure was uh, dairy, then beef, poultry, and swine. Um, and most of the manure users were in two regions. The, these are fairly large, multi-state regions uh, that ERS has. One is the Northern, Northern Crescent, which is basically um, the lake states and the northeast. And then uh, the heartland is not really the Corn Belt, but sort of the Corn Belt. Um, and so, again, this is just um, uh, corn survey uh, data, not all farmers. Um, the form of manure, this kind of, I found interesting, that the form of manure was similar between those who were using their own manure and the off-farm manure. I would have thought there'd be a lot less liquid manure being transferred off the farm and that wasn't the case. So about 70% used solid and about 17% used lagoon liquid in both cases. Um, of the farmers who sourced manure, 61% were paid for it. So that's kind of similar to the data that we got in, uh, in 2006 um, in Missouri and uh, Iowa. Only four people were paid to accept manure in this survey. Um, and then the rest got it for free. So 
um, and, and we sort of don't know the, the social interactions, you know, whether these are neighbors that get something else in return, sort of a um, barter kind of situation, so it shows up as free, but it's not really free. Um, or, you know, maybe contracts, there's no questions about uh, contracts here. So we, on the people who went on the tour saw that there were some farmers here who were sort of in contracts where they either had to pay to get rid of the manure or were giving it away for free, even though the fertilizer prices had changed a lot, but they were kind of locked into um, a previous price situation. Um, so we have only had 169 people who um, had answered all of the, the questions um, that we wanted. So these results are preliminary. Um, the R squared is okay. Um, some things that weren't um, significant: acres of corn planted on the farm. So you'd think, well, if you've got lots and lots of corn, you'd have high nutrient requirements. You'd maybe be more likely to um, pay a higher price for more, and that didn't turn out. Um, no effect of government regulations. Um, and what was interesting and kind of disappointing, but when the more I think about it is not surprising, was that there weren't any regional effects. Once we look, were looking at species and form of manure, um, those regional effects um, didn't appear. The other thing is that when you think about typical distances being three miles, two to three miles, you know, a, a region, multi-state region, you aren't going to see kind of um, any real impacts there. Because of the way our dependent variable was, we put in size of field. Um, so, you know, if you're putting it on larger acres, the total quantity that you're paying for is going to be larger. So that went up. Um, in line with expectations, dairy, beef, and poultry manure got a higher price than swine manure. So this is seems to be a consistent finding across three different studies. Um, being custom applied was associated with a significantly higher price paid, even though the application cost was supposedly uh, a separate uh, question in their interview uh, scenario. Um, the distance between source and field was positively and significantly related to price. So again, this price that they have there includes transportation costs. So that's why these two um, variables, distance and being a lagoon liquid, you would think those would reduce the price that you were willing to pay for manure all else equal, but it includes the transportation costs, so it, it kind of makes sense. Um, so there don't seem to be major differences between the studies that we've done in Missouri and Iowa with our primary data collection and some of this uh, national data, but we're going to dig into this um, in more depth this summer. Um, people are increasingly willing to pay for manure nutrients, uh, which is a good thing. Um, I've always, I'm, I'm interested in the manure issue primarily because I do think it's an underutilized resource, and so it's just, seems dumb that um, there's excess manure that causes environmental problems. Um, and again, being people are, for whatever reason, and, and maybe a primary data study is needed to look at this, uh, why are people willing uh, to pay less for swine manure? So, you know, we've, we've taken the form of manure as a, uh, we've got it, we've controlled for that by having variables in there but the, the species still has an effect. So um, I personally, my guess is that it re relates to smell issues and, and that goes uh, back to one of my, um, one of our findings from a previous study. Organic corn production isn't, doesn't seem like it's gonna be a big um, source of demand for manure. Um, and, you know, people, probably this isn't surprising, but you know, the. The easier that livestock farmers can make it for crop-only farmers to use their manure by either you know, applying it themselves or arranging a custom applicator or whatever um, is going to um, make people more likely to pay a higher price for it or be more willing to accept it. 
Um, and acknowledgements. I'm very <coughs> pleased that um, USDA and NIFA funded this study as part of a larger uh, project and also to ERS for permission to use the data and for the Missouri Egg Statistics Service for being able to sit in their office and work on the data. Any questions? Uh, do you have any idea why the person of ordinary users for the world is very small? I don't. I, you'd think it would be at least a little larger for the manure it's users. Position, maybe? I mean, it, it was a sample, so uh, whether that, you know, they just happened to miss some of the people who are the organic producers, I don't know. It, I, it's surprising. Did you, when it came to this one, when you were talking about the lower values, which is small, with the others, did you see the relationship with the Liquid, 
solid slurry. So, so I have liquid manure and I pay X number for that. I have solid manure and I pay X number for that. And I have soy manure and I pay X number for that. How do you control or, or normalize that number based on liquid or solid? Because we have the, so it's, it's a regression analysis. And the way the regression works is that it controls for certain, you put certain variables in, and that controls for those factors. And then you have these other factors that the, the aspect of the, the liquid versus the solid has been addressed elsewhere. So you can just look at the, the species type. I think there's a lot of other variables that are not looked at that need to be looked at. Because if you do a study in Iowa and you say people are going to pay less for liquid swine manure, first our nutrient concentration of liquid swine manure is pretty decent. And a lot more decent than some of our dairy manures and our beef manures. Um, but I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that people, because of the way the law is written in Iowa at least, Mm -hmm. is you do not relinquish control of your manure. The DNR does not let you do that. So pr crop producers who want that manure from their swine neighbors are willing to get it, but they think it's going to have less value. One is because they think the swine producer has too much manure, and two is because they don't want to have to, they want someone to take care of the regulatory aspect of their land being in that producer's manure being in the plant. So how does it all come in, I, in Iowa, I don't think we're distributing dairy manure in Iowa. I don't think we're distributing a whole lot of dairy manure in Iowa off dairy farms. Okay. Okay. And only recently, like within the last two or three years, have we gotten into distributing feedlot manure off our feed farms in Iowa. I would be happy if people would send me other hypotheses that that don't relate to just dilution of the nutrients.